welcome back to The Sound of Things. That's our um, second episode of our po- podcast. And we have uh, Douglas Quinn, who graciously shared his experience of being a sound designer in, the, in Hollywood, but also beyond with us um, last week. Uh, but this week, we're going to talk about uh, something else. Uh, we're going to go to the very beginning of this fascination of uh, Douglas um, with sound. And what was the beginning, Douglas? Well, great to be back and uh, to continue the conversation. And hello, everybody. Yes, so it's when I think in the context of our conversations, you know, how do you encapsulate a life into a series of podcasts? And I just recognize how fortunate I've been being exposed to so many different ways of being in the world creatively. Uh, And for me, uh, the origins actually came from being a child and growing up in many different cultures and being exposed to different art forms, music, dance, languages, and what have you. And my mother was an artist, and so she taught me how to draw and how to sculpt as a child. Um, But as I grew up, I I, like every kid my age, baby boomer generation, wanted to play rock and roll. So, you know, the, the powerful influence of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Pink Floyd and, you know, the list goes on and on. And as I got more and more interested in music, I realized that I gravitated increasingly to it. So um, I went to Oberlin College in the U.S., and there was uh, introduced to the world of electronic music, just again by chance, much like in the last episode, um, my film work was just by leaving the studio door open and who happened to walk by. And a similar thing happened at Oberlin College. I was an art major, and my advisor said, you know, with your interests, you might enjoy taking a class in electronic music. And so I said yes, and it absolutely changed my life. Uh, I persisted with my art degree, no regrets, but I was uh, exposed to the world of electronic music before computers, really, and learned how to edit reel-to-reel tape and to work with analog synthesizers uh, with a wonderful composer, Derry John Mizell. And really, it, it did change the course and direction of my life completely. So through my studies, I learned about the work of John Cage, who I got to know towards the end of his life, and the German composer Karl Heinz Stockhausen, with whom Derry John Mizell had interacted when he was in San Diego for a brief period. So that's just a little bit of musical DNA for, for you, that in addition to you know, popular music. And I always like the edgier stuff, um, you know, Sgt. Pepper's from the Beatles and um, some of the more experimental uh, work of early Pink Floyd. So that kind of tickled my sonic, um, you know, side in a way and opened up doors when I realized that there's a whole realm of music uh, that influenced them. Uh, and so, again, back to Cage, Stockhausen, Oliver Messier, who worked a lot with bird song transcriptions. So it was a fortuitous suggestion on the part of my advisor. Mm. Interesting. We are going to talk in other episodes about the role of an educator in, in, you know, in the journey of an artist and you as an educator. And by the way, you know, the, it's, it's in the description of the podcast that you are, uh, you know, I'm a former student of yours, but uh, it's always a pleasure to, um, to kind of talk to your mentors and, and, and former professors. And, and, you know, because, because it is an important life. I can kind of, you know, I'm a witness, I'm a witness to it, that it is an important uh, part of your life as oh, an artist. You. So, so we're going to talk about that later, but um, now let's listen to one of your earlier compositions that were, cre- uh, uh, let's listen to this piece of electronic music that was created before the computers. I mean, our younger listeners probably cannot even imagine, you know, what, how, can it, how it can be done. But yet, here it is. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, what was that? What is the title? When what was it written and, and how? How was it made? Uh, this is a great way to, to begin. So the piece is from 1987, so it's old. And it was just with the advent of the digital era and digital sampling. And what you were listening to is not electronic at all. It's all the sounds of the 17-year periodic cicada that comes out in, in the U.S. once every 17 years in different broods. And I just it's one of the most magical sounds on Earth and can be deafening. Uh, when you have a brood of cicadas come up from the ground once every 17 years to have a very short life above ground of only a week or two, they can be almost as loud as a rock concert, over 100 decibels. They're deafeningly loud, but there's such wonderful detail in their sounds. So what this piece was, it's all the sounds of the 17-year cicada. And I liken it to taking through the then new digital sampling technology and keyboards, I could take the recordings that I made of them and almost using the sampler like a microscope I could go into really tiny, tiny details, the individual clicks of the sounds they make, and then explore those using filters that would amplify particular aspects of their sounds so that they would sound even brighter and almost more abstract. So it's painting with a natural palette of sound, but to arrive at a very different understanding of sonic texture and so that's what you were listening to hmm. interesting so of course i'm going to ask you a traditional kind of um interviewer question so how would you define your music you know people you know when i go on spotify and i want to kind of um listen to the kind of music that you write what under which label under which category i would look i always laugh because I have no real control over that. I know what my origins are in terms of, you know, electronic music or what's called musique concrète, uh, which was developed in the 1950s of using, you know, sounds from the environment in a recasting as a musical material. But I've seen my music end up on new age playlists, on ambient playlists, on electronica playlists. So I'm always somewhat amused because of, there's no real one category, but there's a, a deep gratitude and acknowledgement of where my sensibilities have come from. And I, I think for me, a couple of things through studying electronic music, but also being receptive and open given how I grew up. My father was a diplomat, so I moved a lot from Algeria to Sweden to Canada, to Iceland, to Scotland. And so I, I was exposed to a lot. And I think that kind of exposure to people, language, climate, different habitats um, opened my ears as well as my eyes to, to a much broader range of sensibilities than I think I would have otherwise experienced. So I kind of mix these together with the kind of formal education that I got first at Oberlin College and then at the School of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, where I was exposed to even more in by way of sound art and music composition. But I think two, two things that really profoundly influenced me, and one is the Italian uh, futurist Luigi Russolo, who wrote a short essay. He was a composer and an artist. But he wrote an essay called The Art of Noises, and this was over 100 years ago, and it sort of lay the groundwork for the 20th century in terms of music and sound, as much of the Italian futurist art movement did. John Cage picked up with this in um, essays that he wrote in the 1930s in terms of m music being organized sound, and it sort of liberates us from strictly focused on you know, what we think of as a conservatory training and, and that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think I gravitated to a kind of wider and more open vocabulary of possibilities. And certainly so, Italian futurism, 
Dada and surrealism in art and the cross currents with music, I think, are very important. The work of Arnold Schoenberg in terms of the development of the 12-tone system and John Cage, who was a student of Schoenberg's. So I just acknowledge the depth of inheritance that I have in terms of the music that I enjoy making and find meaningful as of making a way in the world. So that's a little bit of background for where I come from. But I think the combination of exposure, education, and just a, a natural intellectual curiosity is what brought me to this reckoning of the world around me sonically. Hmm. So that's something, there's something interesting about what you've just told about the influences that you've just listed. Um, when I, you know, I've worked with uh, quite a few composers in my life. And when just recently I was, um, one of them was in, in a training of mine. And um, I asked her, I said, so what is the most necessary things? Are there any things that without which the composer cannot, you know, do his or her work? And she, interestingly enough, said performance. That was the first thing that that came into her mind. And when I listen to your music, um, you know, I get an impression that you maybe do not need performers, that, you know, it's just you and your recordings and your, um, you know, computer synthesizers, and that's it. The music is ready to go. So can you talk a little bit more about the, the importance of, of performance in your creative process? Yeah, I think that's a great observation, a great question. Um, yep, music is social. It's about communication. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, it's fine if you want to compose music just for yourself, for the gratification of doing it. Uh, for me, there's always an imperative to connect with people. And so I think the, the key things for a composer are, one, the ability to listen. It, it's as much about your capacity to listen carefully and thoughtfully as it is generating the work and absolutely connecting with performers. So with some pieces of mine that are very much studio-based and do happen within the confines of a digital audio workstation or synthesizers or what have you, I've also reached out to and been commissioned to write music that involves performance. And, I, I, and in a broad range from sort of collaborative uh, ventures with people to something where I'll write a piece of music and give it to a group to perform. And it's, it's nice to have the fluidity that it's, it's not always just here's a piece of music, perform it, but that the performance can be something that's improvised through general guidelines and establishing a kind of modus operandi, a world within which the, the improvisation can live and thrive. But improvisation comes back to the ability to listen as much as it does play, to know when to contribute and when to be in receivership. That's, it's like the art of conversation. It goes back and forth. So I've always gravitated to music as a form of conversation and dialogue between performers, between me as a composer, or I might be a composer-performer, um, to also being open to here's a piece of music and handing it off to someone to, to create or to interpret as they will. And I've had wonderful collaborations uh, with Kronos Quartet, working with them using really innovative technology, uh, working with an instrument maker who designed very specialized bows for their instruments from violin to viola to cello. And so that was a wonderful collaborative process with an instrument builder, myself as a composer, and the quartet as performers, but also collaborators. And likewise, working with clarinetist Jerry Arante or another clarinetist, David Rothenberg, there's just wonderful opportunities to create a score, um, either based on, say, ice core data that can be sonified so we could hear climate change expressed through instruments or um, passages of bird song that have been transcribed into a clarinet, uh, but also working with um, Susie Gagnon, who was an accordionist with Cirque du Soleil for nearly 20 years. I think she performed in almost 7,000 shows. And responding to her, reaching out to me to say, hey, let's do something together. And kind of meeting her where she was coming out of this amazing performance, intensive career to, to working together, sort of studio magic, 
but also knowing how much that performance element informs her way of being in the world. So for me, it's very fluid. I think performers are crucial, uh, but I also enjoy the sort of solitude, almost more like a painter would, of being in their atelier. Mm. Okay, speaking of Madame Gagnon, let's listen to a piece that you co-wrote together or that you wrote for her. So can you talk a little bit about the piece? What's it called and how it, uh, how it came about, how it came together? So working with Susie Gagnon was just a wonderful delight. She had reached out to me and I got an email from her and um, she was curious about some of my Antarctic recordings. And the piece you just heard is called Marche Glacial or Ice Walk. And what I worked on with her, she, she, while performing with the circus, she had a lot of time off between shows, and she would basically reach out to other musicians. And so she created a um, sort of an outline of an album and a whole bunch of musical pieces to which I joined her using some of my soundscape recordings. I played guitar and synthesizer on some of the tracks, but they were pretty much her songs and her pieces where I joined her and fit in, and then I produced the album in terms of the mixing and everything. So it really was a, a wonderful collaboration, and she's so brilliantly talented as an accordionist. She's a child prodigy in Quebec and <laughs> literally ran off and joined the circus after university, and after 20 amazing years, um, she continues to work as a musician and a composer. So this was just a, a wonderful conversation to have with her. And she came off the road, this was almost 10 years ago, and we worked together for a week 
on the album together here before she rejoined the circus on its uh, worldwide tour. And then we just did a lot remotely to wrap it up. But this is just such a rewarding experience to to play with someone at that level, much like Kronos or the other people I talked about, Jerry Rante and David Rothenberg, you know, working with people at that level of musicianship and really understanding them and trying to meet with them as a composer, collaborator, a producer in multiple roles, you know, it just makes for some of the most rich conversations that I've ever had with people in music as opposed to just speech. Mm. So a few things you mentioned here. First of all, you know, you're a multi-instrumentalist, you know, from what I hear. And uh, usually, I mean, it's kind of um, in, in the world, especially of academic music or classical music, uh, being a composer is inseparable from playing some sort of instrument. But also uh, being a composer is inseparable from going to premieres of your work, right? And sitting in the audience, uh, you know, watching their reactions, uh, you know, taking the flowers, I don't know, answering the questions. Mm, let's talk a, l- a little bit about, about, about um, your process. Uh, you know, is that also, are those two elements also at play in your creative process and, and to what extent? So I think the you know, creative process for me, particularly given this, the singularity of, you know, on the one hand, singularity of where my interests lie in electroacoustic music, sound art, or soundscape, music concrete, where those sort of come together, it's not it's kind of a traditional, again, sort of conservatory type model. So I, I do love the live performance aspect um, as much as I enjoy the recording process. But I think for me, the compositional process is in a, an organic connection for me in a lot of the pieces that you know I'll be sharing today and throughout the series is the tie-in with the natural world and the tie-in with the sounds of the world around us and how through manipulating and coming to understand them you you inform a, a broader base of really asking what is music what role does it play in our lives what role does it play as um a social interaction as a collective process. And that's what really interests me. And so it may sound a bit abstract, but for me, the compositional process begins when I go into the field to gather material. I'm thinking with a musician's ear, even if it's a scientific project where I'm gathering, you know, bioacoustic recordings for analysis or, you know, material for a film. I'm always thinking through my ears as a composer. How? What am I paying attention to in the soundscape. What, where is my awareness um, in all of this? I, I'm reminded of something Ted Berger said when we were working on the films we talked about last time in One Mind and the Mountain Path. He said, you know, the contemplative gaze is not what we're looking at, but how or what we see, but how we see. And so for me, it's how we listen in addition to what we're listening to. So there's a process compositionally that begins for me by being in the field, whether it's Antarctica or my backyard here in upstate New York. That physical presence of connected with landscape is part of a musical consciousness for me. The gathering of the material is also part of the process. It has to be technically proficient and what can I anticipate in the soundscape around me? So by bringing that musical framing That is part of the process, that physical connection with the environment. And how do I then translate that or reframe that, reorganize the sonic material? Sometimes it's minimal. Other times, like you heard in the Aria Lacoste piece, it's highly manipulated, but works from a very finite set of sounds from this one insect. So within that they exist in a continuum. And then sometimes it it does involve what people think of as music, notes on paper, on staff, key signatures, chord changes. Um, To me, they all exist in a continuum. It's not either or, it's and. And that sort of conjunction, that connection is about thinking of a process that's not just about committing notes to paper um, or 
the performance. It exists for me in a, a, a commitment to the whole process of gathering material, of thinking, of who you're writing for. Is it going to go out for broadcast over radio? Is it going to be a recording? Is it going to be a series of live performances? Is it all three of those? So a bit of a long-winded answer to your question, but I, I, I think it's important. We all have a different process creatively as composers. And I think it's very idiosyncratic depending on what kind of music you do and the way you think of the purpose of your music. You know, is it to entertain? Is it to challenge or provoke thought? Is it emotionally based? Is it intellectually based? Not that these, you know, are separate, but they exist, you know, in a complementary fashion. And so, you know, for, for me, that environmental connection is a huge way of informing a musical consciousness and awareness of the world around us. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in the, in the series. Yes. Um, so would I be correct in saying that uh, your music is not as much a way to connect with other people the way the traditional music is, but it's more about the audience's connection to the environment? To the nature. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's both, really. I, I think that, you know, music is a collective experience, at least ideally. I mean, you know, let's face it, most people now experience music through their phones or earbuds. It's a very solitary experience, and that's fine on some levels. But I also enjoy the collective experience of being at a concert together of hearing music together. And even, you know, before the digital age, you know, when a new record would come out on vinyl from a group that you liked, it was cause for celebration. Everybody came together around a record player and you listened to it together. Yes, you may listen to it by yourself, but there's that collective music making and music listening that will always be crucial to me, whether it's mediated again through a broadcast, a podcast, or a recording, or in a live concert hall. It doesn't really matter, but I'm always aware that the joy of doing this is that it's shared. And when it can be shared collectively in the experience of a moment, it's great. For, for me, the connection to the environment, it's important because we are of the environment. You know, we're, we're part of this environment. It's not something other or out there. It, it We're at the center of it all in some levels. And I think... Music is a way of reminding people of that connection, of, of both using the material from the quote-unquote natural world, but it's a way of reconnecting people, even though it's a mediated connection. Hopefully, I think the best thing for people to do is to listen to my you know, work and then say, geez, I think I'm going to head out and go for a walk and allow you know, what's around me to emerge as a composition. You know, so... That, that environmental connection is an extension of our collective identity for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great uh, metaphor um, to end this episode with. And, uh, and next time, in our next episode, we're going to talk about the things that you can really hear on that walk when you go yeah. outside of your house and, and into the wilderness. So please stay tuned and... Uh, um, listen uh, to us next week. <laughs>